Okay, here we go. Chapter 1 starts the formal presentation of the um, anatomy and physiology. By taking a general approach, and this is biology, how do we classify living things? By their similarities and differences. We are studying the human body, and when we study animals in general, we're a member of that kingdom of animals. What do we see? We see bony skeletons and segmented spinal columns in groups we call vertebrates. So we are vertebrates. Within that group, we see vertebrates that can produce milk in the mother's body. Those are called mammals. And among the mammals, we see a group of brachiators. Now, brachiators means tree dwellers. Kind of interesting that a living thing like a tree could develop to the point where the living organism forms a thing called a forest. And the forest is actually a physical feature of the environment that organisms specialize on and live in. And our grasping hands and grasping feet of our uh, monkey and ape relatives show the importance of climbing and holding on to branches. Common characteristics suggest a common path of evolution. Rather than independent production, it suggests some kind of descent from a common ancestor. We'll deal with that more in a minute. A primary definition, which I hope we dealt with in uh, the lab, is homeostasis. This is a condition of physiology, the chemical processes and the metabolism of cells, of tissues and organs and organisms. What we find when we study life is that the physiology is regulated to produce a consistent internal environment. Now, a lot of people hear that and they think, well, that's equilibrium. It's not equilibrium because homeostasis kind of works in both directions. It can make an ion more concentrated. If it gets too low. It can make it less concentrated if it gets too high. But it's that range and kind of set point that homeostasis continues to burn ATP to maintain. A familiar example of homeostasis in humans is our body temperature. We know 98.6 is kind of the fiction. Some people are a little higher, some are a little lower. But basically, if our body temperature starts to rise, mechanisms in our body change the body's physiology at the moment to dump heat. If our body temperature starts to drop, our body changes in opposite ways to conserve heat. Now, there are limits to that homeostasis. We still have to have the right temperature range and behave in the right way. But in general, we know our body is going to be struggling to maintain those consistent internal environments. Anatomy is a very, very old science, perhaps the oldest, and it studies body structures. There's evidence of study in the Egyptian Empire as early as 1600 before Common Era or 1600 BC. We have evidence of studying the body. Physiology is a little more recent because it took us a long time to conceive that there were cells. All living things are made of cells. Actually awaited the invention of a decent compound lens system. What has become a microscope to verify that simple statement that begins all of biology. And it also, in parallel, took a while to recognize the different nature of different materials and how they reacted and how they affected living organisms. So physiology includes information from biochem, from biology, from chem, from genetics, all of these things that are active today in understanding the operation, the metabolism going on within these cells. We can talk about anatomy on any level. The whole body is gross anatomy with surface features and landmarks, with directions that we need to learn, with internal features like cavities. 
uh, with cut surfaces that can reveal the placement of the organs and the way they um, react to one another. So surface features, regional anatomy, systemic anatomy typically refers to organ systems and we do have 11 of them. 10 of them operate uh, uh, with organs often equivalent in the two genders, but one divides us into two groups, male and female, that identify our reproductive role. Clinical anatomy will focus on the way we reuse anatomy in treating maladies or disease. Developmental anatomy, when we talk about development, I want you to immediately recall one picture. We start out life as a single squishy cell. That cell is the result of fertilization, a sperm joining with an egg to produce that first cell of life. Development are those processes that take that single cell to a zygote, an embryo, and eventually as in, in later stages of development, we call it a fetus. It is born alive and goes through the stages of infancy, of a childhood of adolescence to an adult lives through its long maturity and eventually reaches old age and death. All of those changes are part of developmental anatomy and, and really recognizes and describes the life course of a human being. Anatomy has been amplified by the developments of technology. As I said, the microscope led to the discovery of cells, and we discovered not only that all living things were made of cells, but that cells would differentiate to have specialized functions. Those specialized functions give rise to the science of histology, the study of tissues. So CYT is a prefix that indicates a cell function. Cytogenetics this typically began with the study of chromosomes when we realized that genes were carried on chromosomes, but it is the study of cell genetics. Histology, histo means a tissue study. Physiology can be studied at any level, cells, organs, or organ systems. If we're, effect, if we're specifically interested in human diseases, we call that pathological physiology. We, we're introducing here a concept of a hierarchy, which we're really well familiar with. Most of you have a drawer with your tableware in it. And if you're like me, you have an organizer. You don't just have a pile of knives, forks, salad forks, spoons, serving spoons, slotted spoons, butter knives, all of those things that we acquire over time. But we organize them. We recognize that every the tableware includes knives, so, but not every knife. Every knife is a piece of tableware, but every piece of tableware is not a knife. It's that relationship that we're aiming at for the organization of our understanding of living things. We're going to start not with the smallest level. We don't know what that is, but we're going to start with the smallest level that's important, and that's atoms, like we have seen in chemistry and molecules when we bind atoms together. That's the chemical level of organization. Put those atoms together, we are going to form in our cells organelles, but that's not a level because all cells don't have organelles. But in our cells there are lots of organelles, we've already reviewed them. And together they work to produce a living human cell, the cellular level. Those cells differentiate, once they have a specific function and work in groups, we call that a tissue. There are four tissues, and it kind of brings up a unifying idea for this first lecture test. I keep running into fours. There were four atoms that form most of our biomass. Do you remember that? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. There were four classes of macromolecules, lipids, um, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids that produce over 98% of our biomass. There are four forces in the universe, strong nuclear, weak nuclear, gravity, and electromagnetism. There are four types of tissues, and those are epithelial, 
connective, muscular, and nervous. Only four, but four keeps coming up again and again. Um, if you are failing to remember something, think back, do you have all four? Tissues combine to make organs. And, and it, it, just assume that every organ is going to have all four tissues. Every organ has surfaces, that's epithelium. Every organ has structure, that's connective. Every organ can move to some extent. That means there's a muscular element in there somewhere, and it has to be signaled and regulated by the nervous system. That's the organ level, and put those organs together in groups, and they address a specific function. There are 11 groupings that we call organ systems. Ten of them are required for the healthy life of a body. Only one of them can be functionally removed from the body and that organism still lives a long and healthy life. And the one that can be removed is the reproductive system. In fact, it's so easy to do. We use it standardly in our management of animals that we call domesticated or agricultural animals. We manage them uh, with organ system removal being a common feature. Put those organ systems together and you get an organism. And we can see a great figure here. Check this out in your lab book or in your text, because here are the here is the hierarchy of life we're going to be concerned with mostly from atoms and molecules through. And now this step is is actually a polymer, a different level of the molecule, and an organelle, a sarcomere, into the cellular level. This is a cardiac muscle cell. Here is a cardiac muscle wall, the tissue level within the organ that we call the heart. This is a complete drawing with the heart, the cardiovascular vessels, and inside them the blood, which constitute the cardiovascular system. And together, all of the systems give you the organism. So we know that each uh, system, as we go from left to right, builds to bigger and bigger additions and more complexity. As we go from right to left, we break them down into simpler and simpler elements. Below here are listed 12 figures representing the 11 um, organ systems. This uh, area through cardio, uh, I'm sorry, over here to endocrine, summarizes the systems that we will deal with, the five systems that we will deal with in A and P1. And I would like you to look at the names and get a kind of sound bite idea of what each system does. It's important that you do that now because we may start by studying the integumentary system, but to understand how it works, we might talk about blood flow, the cardiovascular system. We might talk about oxygen uh, uh, supply and the respiratory system and gas exchange as the main function needs to be in your head already. Now over here we have this oddball system that actually divides all human beings into two groups, male and female, depending on the kind of gamete you produce. The only function is reproduction, and this is where that meiosis lives that produces the different types of cells. One aspect of the DNA and that exact copying of cells and DNA before you divide them is that every one of the cells in every one of these systems, including over in the reproductive system, those organs we call the gonads that actually produce the gametes. They're all identical diploid cells based on that exact copying and mitosis. So get an idea of the general function and the names of each organ system. Those are just in the slideshow defined here. And I'm going to kind of skip through this since we've uh, already dealt with this. In the end, we kind of want to know, after the organism, are we really done with anatomy and physiology? Well, anatomy and physiology actually leads us to a lot of interesting questions. We learn it so we can talk about potentials. Maybe the potential is how can we train a body to perform at the highest possible level? We're trying to train an elite level Olympic athlete. Maybe we're dealing with a problem. There's a disease, and we're trying to diagnose that disease 
to stave off death while we heal the body and restore good health. So we can't do that just at the organism level. If you have a bacterial disease, you're already talking about a community problem because one organism is living in you and producing the uh, uh, effects on metabolism that we identify as the disease symptoms. So we will always be thinking about population. For example, right now, the main discussion about the COVID-19 virus is a population discussion around the issue of how do we put a lid on communicating the disease, the disease on passing it from one human to another. So why do we need this kind of breakdown? Because the answer is often at a different level. It may be cancer where the answer is at the cellular level. It may be a poisoning event where the answer is an interaction between a toxin, a poison, and its effect on the metabolism of our cells. So we have to use this information to address such important issues as disease, poisoning, good health. We want to recognize there is such a, such a status as good health. Epidemiology is, is right on the top tip of our tongue. That's what we're dealing with with COVID, not just disease, not just curing the individual, but controlling the spread so that the loss of life is not catastrophic. Infection, how do we pass, how do we get a disease? And allergy, allergy is an interesting one. It's a reaction of our body to a, uh, an allergen, which is by definition something that really won't harm you. Pollen typically doesn't do you any harm. What it does is it institutes an inflammation reaction that's the reaction of our own body that produces the unpleasant symptoms, or in cases like anaphylactic shock, life-threatening ones. So we are well-founded if we understand levels of organization. And we're going through an enlargement here of the levels of organization chart and here an enlargement of these major organ systems. Just to begin, the integumentary system basically covers the body and protects the insides. It's active in regulating body temperature, and it also helps us sense the outside environment. The skeletal system is a rigid set of solid bone that provides support. It sets the size and shape of the body and provides the support that we can hang all of our soft tissues on. It also provides the joints that defines the way our body can move. Why are we bipeds? It's because of the structure of our skeleton. In addition, it has a number of functions like storing minerals, especially calcium. It also forms red blood cells. The muscular system, muscle is a one trick pony. It contracts and pulling on its end, it produces movement. If something moves, it's because of muscle. So moving the body are voluntary outside motions, but equally important, as we rearrange our circulation, I'm, I'm going to go home and eat a meal, and the general circulation is going to be changed by the arrival of food in my intestines, and the blood in my body is going to go to the wall of my intestines. The movement, the, the shift, in that blood flow pattern is caused by constricting certain blood vessels and relaxing the muscles in others. Nervous is our fast signaling system, an electrochemical system that is so fast that it gives us real-time monitoring of our environment and real-time response. If you were standing 20 feet away and threw a ball at my face, I would be able to dodge because of the speed of the nervous system. It provides both sensory and motor responses. The endocrine system is our second signaling system, one that is chemical in nature. And so since nervous is fast, the opposite is slow. So I, I don't want to describe it as that. When you have an endocrine dump, a hormone dump, like a fight or flight situation, you literally are feeling the effects within 15 to 20 seconds and a whole body response is initiated that is optimizing the performance of your muscles, of your lungs, of your heart, of your eyes, while it's taking resources away from things like digestion, like urination, 
like reproduction that are not important for that emergency. The cardiovascular system is replacing the pond water and making sure that the ocean current reaches every living cell. The blood carries those supplies and picks up those wastes and it is actually no different than a single cell living in the ocean. Here's the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a series of vessels that moves a clear liquid called lymph throughout the body. But more and more, more, and more important, we are recognizing as, as the source of immunity and of body protection. Respiratory system, gas exchange, not just oxygen absorption, but CO2 disposal. Digesting is for nutrition, and nutrition uh, requires both oxygen and digestion, the nutrients from that system, and breaks those down to CO2 and water. If you're dealing with proteins over here, you're generating ammonia, and that's what the urinary system does, is remove those waste products that would become toxic very quickly. The reproductive system is named for its effect to produce little offspring, little human beings that will continue the species in the world. So no sound bite for each one of these levels of organization and organ systems. Homeostasis, a stable or consistent internal environment because we're living our body in a variable environment. We know the temperature goes up and down. We know that as we go through a day, we have different states of hydration, plenty of water in our body or relatively less, so we are approaching dehydration. How do we manage these processes? And that is the idea of homeostasis. Our physiology will take whatever we put into the body and try to regulate it within a healthy range. So things that are affected, things like pH or blood sugar or ion concentration, body temperature, are all examples of regulated variables in our body. Um, we maintain this homeostasis, then we have health or ease. Disturb it. If we're out of homeostasis, we have discomfort and disease. So the uh, main part of dealing with a medical problem is to restore that homeostatic balance. Mechanisms of regulation can be auto-regulation, meaning localized to a cell, a tissue organ, a local area where we deal with that change locally. Or it can be extrinsic. There can be a body-wide system like the nerves or the endocrine glands with their hormones that if released into the bloodstream, are going to go all over the body. It's going to affect regulation wherever the neurological system has a synapse and an effector like a muscle or a gland or a fat cell. It's going to, in hormonal form, circulate through the bloodstream on its broadest application, and it's going to be active wherever there is a receptor for that hormone. That's the key. The hormone is a specific chemical signal that's going to produce a change in regulation that's going to affect homeostasis if that location has a receptor. That means that there are different elements to homeostasis. A receptor that's going to perceive the stimulus. What is it we're measuring? Is it temperature? Is it a chemical condition like the supply of oxygen? There are various receptors in the body. Um, the control center that processes the signal and sends out instructions to an effector which carries out those instructions. You know, this basic system is kind of a management system that just doesn't have to be applied just to living things. Here's an example of a control system for room temperature. Normal room temperature is shown here. By the way, this drawing will be repeated again and again throughout the chapters of the book. We always start with the purple circle. Normal room temperature is disturbed. In this case, the temperature is rising. A thermal detector, it's not actually a thermometer, it's a thermistor, inside this control center bends and makes an electrical contact. When that electrical contact uh, here 
in the uh, control center, the processor, makes that contact, it turns on the air conditioner and starts blowing cold air. Now the overall effect, of course, is to cool the whole house, but the main effect we're interested in is right here in the control center where the thermistor is. When it cools down enough, it breaks that contact, and in time, the air conditioner fan shuts off as we've returned the normal uh, room temperature. Here we have the way it actually works. There's a set point. We might set the thir thir I'm sorry, thermostat at 22 degrees Celsius, maybe 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and the temperature will rise the air conditioner will kick on. I'm sorry. And as the temperature rises, it kicks on at a certain point, captures that heat rise and turns it in the other direction. And when it reaches a certain amount of cooling, it turns off, but it continues to drop the temperature for a period of time before the next rise begins. This is typical of the parameters or the vital statistics that we would have in the body. There would be a set point. So for our body temperature, we say it's 98.6. But we notice that normal operation, whether we're still or whether we're active, causes our temperature to kind of vary over an acceptable range. A temperature of 99.1 is generally not considered an important difference. But a temperature of 100 is considered out of range. So when we apply this to living systems, we recognize one property in living systems that is that is fairly general. The response in homeostasis is negative feedback. That means if your temperature is rising out of range, the response of the body is to cool the body off. If your body is chilling down, the response of homeostasis is to warm it back up and keep it within that acceptable range. That's called negative feedback, when the response is opposite to the direction of the stimulus. And we can kind of see that here. Normal body temperature, see the purple circle? Your eyes should go to that first. We're going to disturb that by having the body temperature rise. Maybe we're outside, it's the afternoon, on a clear day last week, and it's 92 degrees temperature Fahrenheit, and it's 90% humidity. So we're not actually getting rid of heat very efficiently. It is temperature sensors in our skin, and also in the flowing blood of the hypothalamus at the base of the brain that sense this temperature, and it rises to a certain point. It sends a nervous system message to the control center. Now that's a thermoregulatory center in the brain that's associated with the brain stem. It's going to send out commands to effectors. So the effectors for cooling the body off are the sweat glands in the skin that begin to release sweat, wetting the skin surface. Now that heat of the body evaporates that sweat and consumes some of the heat, draws it out. At the same time, the blood vessels in the skin go to full dilation. So when you get hot, you know, sometimes you turn kind of a pink color, or you probably know someone who turns beet red when they're hot. That's because the blood vessels are opening up and the blood is rising in the skin, right to below the epidermis. There are no blood vessels in the epidermis, but right below in the dermis, we're flooding that with that hot blood. So the insulating layer is as thin as possible. And so that combination causes more evaporation, heat loss, and the body temperature drops. Here's our set point at 37, ranging kind of from 37.2 to 36.7. Here's where the vessels dilate and sweating increases, basically turning that to heating into cooling. This is where the vessels constrict and sweat release stops and you bottom out as the last of the sweat uh, evaporates and the blood continues to uh, radiate heat away and you begin to warm up again. A set point and a range, and in this case, negative feedback. Positive feedback does occur, and these are events that have a conclusion. 
In other words, the stimulus that's producing the change in homeostasis is going to lead to a conclusion like clotting blood, like delivery of a baby, or like nausea leading to vomiting. This has special nerve connections. Clotting blood is a good example. As we injure tissue, we introduce new conditions here and the release of new chemicals. Let's call those damaged chemicals. There's also debris and cytoplasm and things that don't normally occur. These chemicals start a chain reaction and uh, cell fragments and soluble proteins begin to form a plug. This chemical release is unique. It only occurs where there's damage and this draws both healing cells, injury response cells, and uh, other chemical reactions from the healthy cells around them. This will accelerate the process until we have a stable clot and the loss of chemicals and blood from this break uh, stops. Now, it's positive feedback because the original stimulus was the release of chemicals and the change, and the change continues until that condition of blood loss and blood flow and the release of damaged chemicals like histamine uh, is countered and stopped. When we look at the lab and when we look at the, the um, uh, text, we find this very interesting um, uh, double-sided figure identifying our anatomical landmarks. This is for the purpose of talking about the surface of the body. And some of these are going to be very familiar to you. I doubt very seriously uh, anyone in class doesn't know what nasal means or cranial which usually refers to the skull. Facial refers to the face. That's pretty direct, isn't it? Abdominal, most of you know the ab abdomen is the belly. And so these terms, it's essential that you know all of them for reading purposes and learn them as quickly as you can. I will draw on these for the quizzes and for the test. But some of them will be strange to you and new. But I want to tell you, this figure is very, very heavy in payback. So it turns out that many of these names result from bone names or bone markings or muscular activities from the presence of a, they are used for the naming of arterial elements. So if you learn them now, the first time you encounter them in another organ system, you're already going to know them. Good example. Here is the patellar region. Most of you know that the patella is the kneecap. And so knowing that um, tells you what region it is. Back here is the calcaneal region that refers to the heel, misspelled in this figure, the heel. And that's because this heel bone, a bone that's by category a tarsal, the particular tarsal is called the calcaneus. So it's going to pay you back later to learn these particular markings now. In some case, it's not a whole bone. In some case, it's a bone marking. The point of the shoulder shown here, left and right, is the acromial region. When we study the scapula, there's a big uh, lump of bone that curls around and forms that bump, and it's called the acromion. And that will pay you back, something you won't have to learn when we get to the skeletal system. When we look at the body, we notice that there are cavities and organs, and there are different ways of describing those positions. This simplest system is called the quadrant system because you simply draw a horizontal line and a vertical line that meet in a very prominent landmark here, uh, the umbilicus or the navel. That divides you into upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left, and helps you understand the particular area of the abdomen and pelvic cavities where an organ might be described. But that's pretty coarse division. This one divides roughly in thirds. I kind of always think of tic-tac-toe when I see this, and each of the nine regions is named with a distinct name. Now these names use the terminology of science 
and of anatomy. And once you understand the roots and parse the word, they make much better sense. So the right hypochondriac region, you know, to me, a hypochondriac is someone who imagines they're sick, but hypochondriac break down another way. Hypo means beneath, and chondria refers to cartilage. So this means on the right side beneath the cartilage, and right below here is the cartilage, the, cost, the car, costal cartilage of the rib cage. So that's the reference that makes that region make sense. Epigastric, above the stomach, umbilical is that central region around the umbilicus. So down here is our most useful diagram showing you the approximate positions of the organs and the way that the two uh, systems, the quadrant system and the abdominal pelvic system uh, or the tic-tac-toe system uh, uh, would be used to describe the position of an organ. So if I'm talking about the liver, I'm going to say it largely exists in the upper right quadrant and it spans the epigastric region to the right hypochondriac region for the main bulk of that organ. Now, if you're dealing with um, positions, there, there's not always a handy tattoo or something like the navel. You'll have to be able to refer to directions. And those directions are defined by the formal terminology for body positions. So right and left are as you have learned them in common use. But we are going to have special terms for all the other directions. For the axis of the body shown here on the right, the cranial or cephalic describes the superior position in the body. So if you're moving up, you're moving in the cranial or cephalic direction or in a superior direction. If you're moving down, you're moving toward the base of the spine where the tail occurs. That's the caudal end. That's the caudal direction or down here, the inferior direction. Up and down, superior and inferior. Front and back varies from animal to animal. Front is our belly side, but for a dog, a front is the head end because of its quadrupedal posture. Now what that means to us is that we will refer to the front of the human body as anterior, the front, or ventral because the belly is there. Sometimes it's more uh, uh, sensible to refer to the belly side uh, for some discussions. Conversely, the back side is the posterior or dorsal side. So front and back, anterior and posterior, or ventral and dorsal. Now, left and right is going to be a variable description which refers to the bilateral symmetry of the body. We have a body that's symmetrical around a midline that runs vertically about through the center of the nose, across the center of the, of the uh, thorax and abdomen to this break between the legs, basically separating left from right. We're going to recognize that midline position as medial and anything that moves away from it in either direction as lateral. So, as we talk about the axis of the body, which is the head, neck, and trunk, as we talk about the axis, if we move away from the midline, we are talking about a lateral movement. If we move toward the midline, we are talking about a medial movement. Now, that means that this, this left and right actually changes direction. If I asked you a question, Describe the movement from the right acromial region to the left acromial region. You would describe it by saying from the right acromial region, you move laterally to the, I'm sorry, medially to the midline 
and then laterally from the midline to the left region. Those directional terms that I've already dealt with, as I said, refer to the axial skeleton, the head, neck, and spinal cord region. However, there are appendages on every animal body. We have four, and every appendage has an, an end of attachment. That end of attachment is called the proximal end and a free end. Down here on the fingers or the toes, it's free. And so that's called the distal end. So for describing movement on an appendage, if you're moving toward the attachment, that's proximal. If you're moving toward the free end, away from the attachment, that's distal. And proximal and distal are preferred for describing directions on the appendages. Now, if you have to move from front to back, you might use anterior to posterior. But in general, for example, moving in the distal direction, if you're moving from the elbow to the wrist, you're moving distally um, if you're on uh, the arm. And um, uh, that's preferred to inferior, even though in this position you're moving down. Let's talk about this position. It's tiresome to have to say, well, I'm going to place the body in this position and then describe the movement. So we have a standard anatomical position that's shown here. Please, when I ask you for the anatomical position, begin by writing down stand erect. Everyone understands what that is, and it places your body overall in a very almost total anatomical position. Stand erect with face, palms, and toes pointed forward, and with hands slightly spread from the hips. That's the anatomical position. Always begin, stand erect. And in our reading, lab or lecture, if it says something about position or direction, without qualifying it in terms of a different position, just assume we're dealing with the anatomical position. When we discovered the internal workings, both the organs and the fluids that they contained, it became important to explore the inside of the body. So we do that with cut surfaces. These three uh, sheets show the ways we can cut the body to separate. You'll notice that this sheet separates left from right. This sheet separates anterior from posterior, and this sheet separates uh, top from bottom. So we have three kinds of cuts. The sheet that separates anterior from posterior is called a frontal or coronal plane. Notice that the positioning of this sheet would produce a cut surface that exposes the a cut surface on the body in every part of the body when in the anatomical position. So we're picking up the knees, the stomach, the cranium from this frontal or coronal cut, always separating front from back. This one separates left from right, the sagittal plane. Notice the placement of the sheet. This one is particular called the mid-sagittal cut. It's on the midline, pardon me, on the midline. And it also produces the same cut every time. If you move this plane, let's say three centimeters over to here, and cut, you would have what's called a parasagittal cut. So moving it to here, you would miss the hip altogether. Notice that the mid-sagittal cut enters the top of the head and departs the body down here at the base of the pelvis, since the legs in the anatomical position are lateral, left and right, to the uh, mid-line of the body. Finally, this plane separates up from down, and you'll notice the position of the cut. You get a nice oval cut for the axis of the body, and then two small circular cuts for the lower antebrachial region just above the wrist. This is called a transverse or horizontal cut. Now, the way we would use this is to label a particular um, tissue cut surface. So we make a cut 
and it's exposing organ surfaces and tissue surfaces. And we might describe it in the following way. This is a transverse cut at the level of the L4 vertebra. That would tell you that in the anatomical position, it is right at the transition between the upper abdomen and the lower abdomen, basically exposing the um, organs in approximately this region, kind of right above the pelvis. Now, when we explore the inside of the body, we notice that all of these organs occupy very specific cavities. There are two main cavities. The dorsal one includes the cranial cavity above, not illustrated in this figure, but following the position that the pointer is circling now. And descending through the aperture in the spinal cord that holds the, um, uh, the, the uh, spinal cord uh, uh, in the vertebra. So we have a cranial cavity and a spinal cavity or vertebral cavity on the dorsal side. The larger cavity is on the ventral side, which is a huge cavity spanning the base of the neck to the base of the pelvis. This is divided by a natural membrane called the diaphragm into an upper thorax and a lower abdomen. The abdomen is uh, abdominal pelvic cavity. The abdomen blends into the pelvic cavity when it enters the kind of the perimeter or the border of the pelvic uh, girdle. When we look at a transverse section through the thoracic cavity, we notice the right lung and left lung have a space between them. This space is called the mediastinum, and it does include the heart. The heart and pericardium actually are in the mediastinum. The heart is surrounded by its own membrane, as are all of our organs, a serous membrane, which is a double walled membrane. We're going to study the membranes and their formation a little when we talk about tissues. But this mediastinum is not just a chamber for the heart. It also is big tube central. If you think about the thorax up here, what's running through the mediastinum? The major blood vessels, the vena cava, the pulmonary arteries and veins, and the aorta. The esophagus for digestion, the trachea for respiration, the major sinuses of the lymph system. All of these tubes are crammed into this space and moving through it. And that means that there's a, a, a great prospect that might tangle up. So we are going to see a lot of fat packed in here as a cushioning to keep those, uh, allow them to move. This is a moving body. It has to be able to flex and bend, but it will prevent, it has enough attachment and rigidity to prevent tangles. We have modern techniques that penetrate the body and allow us to visualize the insides without cutting. We see here x-ray as our main, your main penetrating radiation, allowing for profiles and outlines that can be uh, interpreted. This is a, a, a supplemented uh, x-ray. In this case, barium has been introduced, which is opaque and allows us to study the digestive tract. This shows the contours, in this case, of the stomach and a portion of the intestines. Computed tomography is a scan that uses the computer to analyze the image in different ways. So we rotate the x-ray and look at the way the x-ray beam changes in its penetration. And this computed tomography gives us a little, a, a little different uh, external view. We have MRIs. That's based on magnetic resonance. Basically, we are um, uh, uh, resolving on greater uh, a resolution than a computed tomography scan. This is positive emission tomography, and this is using ultrasound, most commonly experienced uh, through the monitoring of the development of the fetus within the womb. But basically, anything that uses echoes uh, is a kind of an ultrasound. 
Here we see a scanning method. This is called an angiography. We're going to see this next semester. We examine a good heart. Look at that very open artery carrying blood all the way to the base of the ventricle. In an occluded artery where blood flow is stopped, that would be a prospect for a bypass surgery or for a stent. If it is not corrected, then the deprivation of blood flow to the heart wall can cause a cardiac event. So here are enlargements of those figures showing you the stomach position and the upper portion of the um, uh, small intestine as it joins. Basically, it ducks out behind uh, in this figure. Here's an ultrasound uh, that at this moment is providing an excellent profile of the fetus inside the womb. It's interesting to see these because the fetus is also moving. And so it will appear for a moment and then it will uh, basically turn and the image will be lost. Now, for chapter one, essential, conce essential concepts and skills to define anatomy and physiology, to understand these general principles we're going to apply again and again. Levels of organization refers to that atom to organism and back sequence of hierarchy. Um, and how they integrate one to another. The body is sick. The symptoms tell us it's a bacteria. That means we're going to have to address that. What do we have that can kill that cell? In this case, antibiotics are effective against many bacteria. The organ system overview provides us a way of understanding what the body is doing as each of our organ systems is being explained. Homeostasis, that physiological concept of maintaining a consistent and striving to maintain a stable internal environment. We had a figure for surface and regional anatomical terms. We looked at the abdominal pelvic divisions and contents. We talked about how we define directions, where the cavities are. And by the way, in cavities, we only did the major ones. There are many small cavities. The most numerous cavity is called the synovial cavity. It's a cavity around each movable joint. So one here in my elbow, many here in my wrist. All of the connections of the bones in the upper appendage, the arm, hands, wrists, and fingers are synovial joints, starting with the shoulder blade. That has a cavity. It has a synovial membrane that's filled with synovial fluid. And I want to just preview here. What's the importance of that? It adds hydraulics to the movement and support of our joints. Not just a cushioned bone end rubbing against another cushion, but hydraulics inside that cavity that makes that movement free of friction and easy. And finally, the membranes that are found around our organs and manage their position, allowing for support. But that support is more like kind of like a hammock. You've got to hold it in position so that it's not moving around to different positions relative to the organ. Allow, but it still has to allow some movement and flexibility as we move our body. That's the wonder of membranes. They're thin, but they're strong. Membranes have that kind of saran wrap strength. So if you have saran wrap, I mention that because of the clear plastic wraps, it's still the strongest. You know if you poke saran wrap with a point, it breaks and tears easily. But if you held saran wrap like this and put something like a cantaloupe on it, it holds it. Put on another cantaloupe, put on another cantaloupe, and it will stretch. But as long as you don't pierce it, it will hold things in position. That's kind of what our serous membranes are like. And our mucous membranes are like. Even, even each with a specialty that allows them to perform their special function in support or in uh, secretion. So, lucky us, we have now completed the recording of chapter one, the language of anatomy. So let me do my magic here.
by stopping the recording. This recording will be 